When Jesus says, my, my sheep will know my voice, you, you, can, uh, you can see that, for example, elsewhere in John's Gospel, where uh, he, he, uh, he says, Mary, and then she recognizes him by, by his voice. In my early Christian life, the circles I was in, I thought I had to earn my way into God's presence. Like, you know, okay, the first hour is to earn your way into God's presence, and then after that, you can get down to business. But that's really not what the Bible says. You go to John chapter 14, and actually John 14 through 16. But as Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, and he's talking with his disciples, he talks about his presence. It's not something we earn. It's something Jesus essentially earned for us. And I'm going to, well, I'll start with 1423 because that's pretty clear. And then I'll, then I'll go to something that's not as clear just because it's fun. I love to talk about the Bible. Uh, but if you're not persuaded in that part, at least you'll get it from John 1423. Jesus said, if anyone obeys me, anyone keeps my commandments, I and the Father will love them and we will come and make our dwelling within them. And this is in the context of him talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So we're always in the presence of God. But even toward the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is already pointing towards this. His disciples don't understand right away, and we don't understand right away unless we read through the whole context. But Jesus says, in my Father's house, are many dwelling places, and I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can come and be with me. And one of the disciples said, wait a minute, we don't know where you're going, so how could we know the way? And Jesus answers. He tells him what the way is. He says, I am the way and the truth and life. And then he also tells him where he's going. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, if John 14, 6 is a salvation verse, and it is, how do we come to the Father through Jesus when we, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, right? If that's a salvation verse, then 14, 2, and 3 are also salvation verses because we come to the Father's house. We come into the Father's presence when we accept Christ, you see. I don't know about that. Well, what does the Father's house mean elsewhere in the Gospel of John? Now, that's kind of hard. That doesn't really solve it. John chapter 2, it's the temple. John chapter 8, I think it's verse 35, it's the Father's household. Uh, we, we belong to the Father's household. But in John 14, the rest of the context makes it clear. Jesus is saying, I'm going away, I'll come back to you. What coming is he talking about? Is he talking about his coming that's still future to us? He, he does talk about that plenty in the Bible, but that's not the coming that he addresses specifically in John 14. John 14, he's saying, I'm going away, I'm going to the Father, I'm going to die. After I, after I rise, I'm going to come to you, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. That happens in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, when he comes to them, breathes on them, says, receive the Holy Spirit, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. So, also he says, in my Father's house are these many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come back. I'll receive you to myself. Um, well, these, these rooms, these many rooms in the Father's house, what are they? The Greek word that's used there is the word mone. It's used only twice in the entire New Testament. The other place it's used is later in this chapter in verse 23 where the Father and the Son, by the Spirit, come and make their dwelling place within us as believers. And the verb form of that, abide or dwell, meno, is used all over the place. You know, the Holy Spirit, counselor whom I'm going to send, is with you in the person of Jesus. He's with, with them because he's in Jesus and will be in you. And he talks about the Spirit abiding in them. He talks about you abide in me, I abide in you, like branches in the vine. So he's talking about being in his presence. The same Jesus who washed his disciples' feet that night 
is the same Jesus who's with you at this very moment. But he didn't start being with you when you realized he was with you. He was already with you. So it's not your realizing it that makes it happen. It's already true. So you may as well realize it because it's already true. Because it comes from him. That's where our relationship comes from. So we don't have to work something up to hear God's voice. We can hear God because he's already with us. Sometimes uh, I'll be praying and I'll hear him, but sometimes I will be just doing something else and he'll speak. I had gotten this letter from my dear friend in Congo saying she didn't know if she was going to live or die. Her cousin had just been shot dead. Her brother and father had nearly been shot dead. They'd been shot at, barely escaped. And by the time I got her letter, her town had already been burned down. I was panicked. I didn't know what to do. It's pouring my heart out to God over the next few days. Well, actually, it was when I was doing the dishes. I, I, I wasn't specifically praying, but I, I heard the Holy Spirit say, someday you and she are going to minister together in Francophone Africa. And for the next 18 months, until she actually got out of war and was able to send me another letter, I didn't know if she was alive or dead in terms of other evidence. All I had to hold on to was that God said that someday she and I were going to minister together in Francophone Africa. And it has happened since then. Um, and also along the way, we, we ended up getting married. But that's, that's another story. Uh, also involved with, with God speaking. But it means we don't have to wait for a feeling. God, God can use feelings, but he's already with us. And often he'll speak to us and often we'll, we'll know him in the most intimate ways in worship. I mean, we can study about him, but when we're really focused on him and we're really expressing that to God um, in worship, that's a, a good setting for hearing from God, for, for revelation. I mean, First Chronicles 25, you had uh, the priests and the Levites there, according to their courses. They were to prophesy in giving thanks and praise to the Lord. Many of the Psalms come from that Old Testament charismatic worship, worship by, by the Spirit, prophetic worship. If that was true in the Old Testament, you can, you can be sure that that's going to be our context also in the New Testament. I mean, look at the Psalms, like uh, I think Psalm 12, Psalm 46, Psalm, Psalm 91. It'll go from speaking to God to God speaking, because the same Spirit can, can inspire both. Well, one thing that's important to keep in mind, though, is that what God speaks will be consistent with what God has already spoken in Scripture. So if you get full of what God has already said, you'll be more likely to recognize his voice. Uh, at the same time, recognizing his voice also helps you. When you know his character, you know what he's like. You take that into account also when you, when you read Scripture. Uh, so we need to watch out. I mean, if we've been abused or broken, sometimes we'll fasten on to the wrong parts. I mean, the message of judgment is there in Scripture, but it's not for everybody. It's for the people who are doing the things for which judgment is, is visited. So knowing God provides us a context for, for hearing the Bible more, more closely. When I read a book by somebody I know, and I know their voice, like Gordon Fee, I can be reading a, a what looks like a dry commentary by Gordon Fee, and I can I can hear it in his voice. I can know when when he's like shouting, he's preaching this stuff because I know I know his heart. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us when we when we read Scripture as well. Now, there was a friend I had years and years ago when I was a young Christian. 
I was pretty immature. I'd just gone off to my first year of Bible college and just come back. This was somebody that I had taught about hearing God's voice and, and knowing God's heart after my own experience with it. I went off to, to college. I came back, and she was so much better at it than I was. She was having visions all the time. I had never had a vision. In fact, I, I still haven't had a vision. I mean, not a, a literal one, like, all the way. I mean, there are things I'm, I see in my heart and so on. <sighs> and being the, the very spiritual person I was, and bearing all the fruit of the Spirit that I did, I was jealous. I was like, God, that's not fair. I've been a Christian longer than she has, and I've never had a vision. Well, one day we were getting ready to meet, and I said, God, I need to have a revelation because Barb is going to have a revelation. She always has a revelation, and, and she's going to like look down at me if I don't have a revelation. And God was very gracious with my, my immaturity, and he showed me something about, uh, well, yeah, he, sh he showed me a couple things that night. And when I met with her, I told her immediately one of the things God showed me. And she said, ah, God showed me that weeks ago. I was kind of depressed. And then she told me about the, the newest thing that God had shown her. The newest thing that God had shown her, she said, was, well, you've heard of the Trinity, right? Three, if you're good with math. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, there's going to be a fourth one now. We are going to become part of God. We're going to become the fourth member of the Trinity. I was like, Barb, that's not in the Bible. She said, oh, no, I know it's not in the Bible. It was just revealed a couple weeks ago. I'm like, Barb, <laughs> I mean, you look at Revelation 22, as far in the future as you can go, that's never going to happen. We're going to be a servant serving him before his face. She said, it's farther in the future than that. And she and her friends started jumping on me. You're not spiritual. You're just, you don't care about, all you care about is the Bible. You need to hear about, hear things from the Holy Spirit. And she told me sometime before this that she didn't really read the Bible that much. Because, you know, the people back then, they had their revelations. But she can get her own revelations. So why does she need to pay attention to their revelations? Well, this was a good illustration of why you need to pay attention to their revelations. Because you can go off a deep end if you don't. I mean, God gave us scripture as an objective parameter, so to speak. So we recognize God's voice and we can walk in his ways. And uh, Barb eventually realized she was wrong on that, but uh, it, was, it was kind of painful along the way. So, uh, and actually, why do we listen to their revelations? In Jeremiah's day, there were a whole lot of people saying that they heard from God. Jeremiah was the only one who was hearing the right thing from God. And yet he stood in continuity with a whole line of earlier prophets who had been saying the same thing that he was saying. So it's not just lining up with what everybody else says the Holy Spirit is saying. I mean, 1 Kings chapter 13, there's a, a prophet there who, you know, the Lord told him, don't go eat with anybody. You just, you just go back. And another prophet came to him and said, well, the Lord told me you're supposed to come eat with me. So he said, oh, okay, he went and ate with them. And then the real word of the Lord comes to the other prophet and says, because you disobeyed God, you're dead. And it happened that way. We can't just take what somebody else says. At the same time, we have Scripture. You know, in Jeremiah's day, people were confused. But the next generation, three books of the Bible, I'll declare, and when the word of the Lord, according to the prophet Jeremiah, was fulfilled, Guess whose book made it into the canon? Not those other prophets. What we have in the Bible isn't all that God has ever said. I mean, every time God's Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're God's child, God is speaking. But we're not going to put in the Bible that God is speaking to Ken, you're God's child, or God is speaking to Raymond, or God is speaking to Melissa, you know, you're God's child. It's enough for the Bible to say that God's Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we're God's children. But you know, there's a lot of other things God said, but the purpose of a canon, the purpose of Scripture, it's a measuring stick. It's how we, we know this is, this is God. We use it to evaluate all other claims to, to revelation. And uh, Barb learned that the, the hard way. 
Um, there's a continuity of the message of, of prophets and apostles through history, and true prophets and true apostles are not going to contradict that when they're speaking by the word of the Lord. Well, in terms of hearing God's voice, how do we start with that? A good place to start is asking God for that. I mean, again, God is already there, but you want to hear him more clearly. You want to learn to hear him more clearly. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 14, 1 and 14, 39 talk about seeking for spiritual gifts. And, and uh, a couple of those zero in on the gift of prophecy. 14, 13 says, you know, if you, if you, you, you pray in a tongue and there's nobody there to interpret, then you can pray that you may interpret. You know, we can pray for, for spiritual gifts. Uh, Paul there is emphasizing the gifts that will build up the body the most. He's not against things that will build you up personally, just the same as we read the Bible for personal edification as well as for corporate edification. But we, we can pray for what will be useful for building up the body. We can also pray for what will be useful for building us up. Um, it was when I was a really young Christian that my pastor's wife taught on uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and about seeking the gift of prophecy. So I started praying for the gift. And then one time in the, in the youth group, now again, I, I just been, I've been converted from a background in atheism. So I'm devouring the Bible now, but it's for the first time. You know, I'm just learning it as, I, as I'm going along. But I, I prayed for the gift of prophecy. And this one time we were praying together before the youth group, and I felt this overwhelming sense that God was saying something. But I was like, I'm not sure if this is God or not. God, if it's really you, please make somebody else say it. And then somebody else prayed out a prayer that said the same thing pretty much. I mean, not identically word for word, but it was the same spirit, the same, the same message as what I was about to prophesy. And so I said, okay, from now on, I'll do it. And it started happening in the church services. It was a Pentecostal church. I didn't get thrown out. When I prophesied in the cafeteria in Bible college, um, at the top of my lungs, I, I could have gotten thrown out of that. But anyway, it, it was it was all right. It was Pentecostal Bible College. Uh, they had to get over it. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm not recommending these things. This is just the way it happened to me. But in any case, as I, uh, it, it was sometime after that when I first began hearing God's voice for myself, like when I went out for the walk, I talked about earlier, and I heard God, God speaking. <sighs> That's the way he spoke to me. And, and again, I'm not saying this is the way it always happens, but this is just the way it happened to me. Um, Hosea chapter 1, it says, When the word of the Lord came to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, By Hosea. Which makes me think kind of he prophesied to himself. Um, you have that some other times in the Old Testament as well. Jeremiah, thus says the Lord to me. <laughs> or in, uh, in 2 Samuel, where he starts uh, prophesying, uh, th these, these are the words of God through David, and then it prophesies to David. So since I'd already moved in the gift of prophecy, that's how it first came to me articulately when I, when I went out to pray. Uh, that went beyond feelings and impressions, but actually came out in articulate wording. Now, uh, it is important to recognize that between the point where the impression is coming and it becomes articulate, uh, just keep in mind, God doesn't make mistakes in speaking, but we can make mistakes in hearing. So, uh, we need to grow in this. But again, talking about how we pray for the gift. So talk if you if you can pray for the gift of prophecy, you can certainly pray for the gift of of hearing God's voice. Luke eleven thirteen. The the parallel passage in Matthew. If you ask for good gifts, your father, your heavenly father will give you the good gift. But in Luke eleven thirteen, it focuses on the best gift of all. Uh, same context of prayer that you have in Matthew, but but Luke zeroes in on something that's certainly included in good gifts. The best gift of all is God himself, God's own presence, 
And Jesus says, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, your Heavenly Father will give that. Now, obviously, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. But we see in the book of Acts, it's not just the one-time thing. And in the book of Acts, we actually see the, the prayer and then the, the public outpouring of the Spirit on, on communities of believers. So in Acts chapter 1, you have the believers uh, praying together. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 4, they pray together. They pray that God will continue to stretch forth His hand with, with signs and wonders so that they may speak the word of the Lord with boldness. And in, in 431, it says, and they spoke the word of the Lord. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Um, and then, and then you have some other connections, uh, where, um, Cornelius is praying. Peter is praying. Cornelius is going to get filled with the Spirit. Um, and, and, uh, Paul is praying and fasting in, in chapter nine, uh, verse 17. He's going to get filled with the Spirit. It, the connection isn't made in every case in the book of Acts, but we do get this pattern. And actually, when I was in uh, Indonesia one time teaching, I had a dream. And in the dream, the question was asked to me in your four-volume Acts commentary, what's, after all that work, what's the, the most important insight that you can give us from the book of Acts? And... This wasn't new with me. I'm not the first person by any means who ever said this. Um, and I mean, it's kind of obvious, I think. But what came to me in the dream that the, you know, if somebody asked me, what's the most important thing you can tell us that you learned from the book of Acts? It's this relationship between prayer and the coming of the Spirit. We ask and God will give us the gift. And, and I think it's not just the initial gift but the continuing work of the Spirit, we can continue to pray that God will continue to, to take us deeper. Um, as my friend Randy Clark talks about, there is more. <laughs> we don't have to stop. So, um, but, but also we don't want to put God in a box. I mean, you're praying for the outpouring of the Spirit. That looks a lot of different ways. It looks different ways in different times in history. You can have laughing, you can have crying. In the book of Acts, Acts 13, they were filled with the Spirit and with joy. So obviously that, I mean, it's a fruit of the Spirit anyway. Shouldn't have freaked anybody out if you have that. But God's Spirit can move in different ways, and we see that happening on different occasions in the book of Acts, these corporate outpourings of the Spirit. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 5. You can pray for wisdom, but just pray in faith, uh, he says in the next verse. And in James, he goes on to describe true faith is the kind of faith that will live in accordance with their faith. So you pray for, for, uh, for wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Well, then you just better be willing to obey with whatever the Holy Spirit says. But what is wisdom except hearing from God? I mean, when God is giving us wisdom. Just like uh, James talks about a couple kinds of faith, it also talks about a couple kinds of wisdom. But the true wisdom, which is from God, which is pure, not mixed with the other kind, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy and good fruit, and so on.